on? Can y'all hear me? Yeah, it is. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I see a lot of like familiar faces, some FAIC people, some buds, people who I don't know yet. So let's all hang afterward also. <laughs> um, so this is going to be, I think, about an hour of my part, and then we'll have about an hour of like workshop time when you can try stuff out. So if you have stuff, we'll organize that as soon as this wraps up. Yeah, thank you all for coming. So before I start, I would love it if you have questions like in the midst of this whole thing to just like bring them to the mic. You can just stand up and walk over there, grab it. Um, rather than saving them for the end, like let's keep the conversation going. And also comment. So if you're like, here's the thing that I noticed that I want to talk about, you can just grab the mic and let's make it more of a discussion as much as possible. Um, cool. So to get started. I had some ideas um, beginning this when I was preparing for this and thinking about what to talk about. Based on a couple of different experiences that I've had with multi-channel sound. Um, so today, I would love to talk about the many possibilities for embodiment in zones of multi-channel sound, including dynamics of access, ability, and identity. Um, these are things that I talk about a lot in my life as a sociologist and like a sound studies person, but I think about them a lot in kind of more practical, like, you know, art making context also. And they definitely came up in a big project that I did, I guess that was like two years ago, or one, one or two years ago, um, in the pavilion downtown, um, with some kind of like errors that came about. So something I'd love to talk with you all about and hear more about like how, how that could work better. So a few questions that I want to talk about. Um, first, who can enter the installation zone for any given multi-channel space? What can a diversity of bodies experience there? Thinking about the range of bodies that exist in the world, um, what can they experience differently? And how can artists open up the zone as a social practice rather than closing it off? So if you have thoughts on any of these as we continue, please just like, just speak up. Um, but then I'll also be asking you some questions I think later too. All right. So my um, work with multi-channel sound really began I think in 2017. Um, 2016 or 2017, um, when I had a time when I worked and um, lived in New York and also was like a, a full-time installation assistant at Lamont Young and Marion Zazila's Dream House. Has anyone been to that space before? Yes, yeah. amazing. Okay, so for anyone who has or hasn't, they actually could really use more support. So go to the Mella Foundation website and offer support if you can. They're um, always in kind of in need of funding and it's a classic space. It's been an installation since 1993, I believe, and they rent the space. So it's not a building that they own. Um, if you have any extra resources, definitely kick it their way. So this space um, is a sound installation with, I think, you know, four speakers generally. Sometimes that's a little bit that's changed over time and a synthesizer that's in this back room and it creates at least um, 31 frequencies, I think with combination effects, there might be more frequencies happening that are mostly sine waves. Um, this is an installation of light and sound. So you can see that the light in the space um, is this kind of mostly like really intense pink, purple, and blue light with windows that are covered. So you get some natural light kind of adding to that. And the light installation is by Marion. And then the sound installation is composed and designed by Lamont Young. Um, also actually installed and kind of like technically came about with um, Bob Bielecki's help, who's a total audio genius, I think, behind the scenes of so much sound art that happens in New York and actually around the world. Um, this is the name of the composition. And I don't know if I should read it all, but you can read it for yourself. The base 974 symmetry and prime time when centered above and below the lowest prime term primes in the range, etc. This huge statement um, describes what frequencies are happening and I have to say that this is kind of an esoteric description to me. It's, I don't really understand exactly what it means. Um, if you all can like illuminate for me what this is, please do. Just to describe my experience. So I would have um, brought some like documentation of this, but they don't allow any documentation except this photo, which is on the Mella Foundation website, um, and no audio documentation of the space whatsoever. It does exist online, so I'm not encouraging you to go find this um, this illegal documentation, but it's out there if you just go on YouTube and look it up. Um, my experience with this space is, so first of all, I was helping install um, work for their disciple, Jung Hee Choi. And this is an example um, of Ahata Anahata Manifest Unmanifest 11 from 2015, but I was working on this one in 2016. Um, so wait, this should actually be 10. I, that's a typo. So this was in um, 2016, the one that I worked on. So during the days, we would just be in the space, kind of like 
bringing in this work to describe this piece. This is an exhibition that happens about every year, and it's called a light point drawing. So the way it works is there are these kind of needle point um, holes in black wrap that then is back projected with, I think, eight different projectors, sometimes more. So it creates this moving image, um, yeah, with abstract light. And there's a sound installation happening at the same time with the same system. So that's kind of, that's why I was there. But um, for most of the time, this is a space with all of these frequ this frequency array that um, is very responsive to bodies in the space. So my experience during those days when I was kind of like not doing the installation assisting, but just in the space when it was on, um, is very slight body motion of any kind changes what you're hearing. So if I'm breathing even, that slight up and down motion is enough for me to hear a change in some of the sine waves that I'm hearing. Also, if you're doing bigger changes, if you get down to the ground, jump up in the air, you hear extreme differences. Also, if you move closer or further away from the speakers, you have that same effect, right? Which is like different sounds happening. It really activates a body in the space it activated my body in the space to make me feel much more aware of what I was experiencing and also brought about all kinds of responses from different people who were there. So some people would be lying on the ground, some people were able to fall asleep, which is incredible because it's really, really loud. Um, and some people are doing all kinds of movement work. So, you know, yoga kind of like exercise or those kind of practices, um, dancing, all kinds of movement, and it's pretty much just open. So I think it stays open really late at night if you're interested in checking it out. And I think at the time it was like a $5 donation to go in and just spend as much time as you like. So this experience really opened me up to this whole world of multi-channel sound, um, and especially frequency arrays of these kinds. So these are sine waves that all have relationships with one another. And so that was kind of um, a really inspiring experience for me. Okay, so I'm not gonna show these videos. The direction that this took me was to start exploring and working with binaural beats. Um, I'll just like briefly explain what these are. I think probably most people in the room are familiar with what this is, how it works in, um, in acoustic physics. So they were discovered in 1841 by Heinrich Wilhelm Dove with tuning forks. And you know they, the way that it works is with two sides of your head, with your two ears, in the kind of like the most exaggerated effect. And then there was a paper published in 1973 that actually connected that to psychology. So this was a physical phenomenon that was known and kind of had existed for a long time before it was linked to any kind of psychological effect. But I think today, if you ask someone about binaural beats, they'll probably talk about those psychological effects. Um, which are many. So um, yeah, there are documented examples of people having lowered heart rates and breathing rates, um, all kinds of you know, biomeasures that change when they're listening to certain types of these um, phenomena. So the way it works is when you have a sound that's coming just in an isolated way to one of your ears, the left ear for example, at 124 hertz, and then on the other ear, um, 10 hertz lower, your brain registers three different frequencies. So you can hear the frequency of 124 and also 114. Um, some documentation also says that you hear that kind of additive or the, the uh, arithmetic average of the two. So you would hear, um, yeah, what would that be? Uh, plus five, 119. So you might hear those three, but you also hear this other one, which is just 10 hertz. And that um, is located in the superior olivary complex. And you can see kind of like a diagram. I apologize, that's kind of small. But you can see, a, um, see some of the, the parts of the auditory cortex that are in that brainstem region. So that's um, the part of the brain that processes sound input from both ears and is responsible for all kinds of like regulation of all, you know, many bodily processes. So when you perceive these two different frequencies and then you hear that very slow one, this is where um, the possibility for some sort of like uh, coaxing of your brain activity up or down is possible. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, that's less documented. So the fact that there is that this physical uh, phenomenon exists is one thing, and then beyond that, that it would have some effect on kind of like your psychological state is also documented in scientific literature. Um, beyond that, there's, um, there's a whole range of like undocumented effects that lots of people individually experience and that I've experienced as well. So just a side note, individuals also perceive binaural beats very differently from one another, and some people don't perceive them at all, even um, you know, at the kind of like physical level when they report being in these spaces. Okay. So I'm actually going to save this section for a moment and play a little bit of work to get us, um, to get us started. So I was really fortunate um, a couple of years ago to take part in the Sonic Pavilion Festival. ESS um, included me in that. And this is a piece called Almost Gone that was 
written for stereo, and then I kind of transformed it into a multi-channel piece. Um, so this is the image of the cover of what was the stereo recording, um, which is a ceramic piece designed by or created by Ike Floor, a really brilliant ceramicist. And I have a couple other images here of Ike's work. I always just want to like talk about Ike's work when I can because I think it's so brilliant. Um, so this piece is enormous. That was the cover. I mean, I don't know if you can see me back here, but it's a huge piece of glazed ceramic, like like that kind of circle, um, that still exists at their house. And yeah, was created just for this piece. And I think um, I just I just love very much. I was also inspired for this piece, both the multi-channel version and the stereo recording, through an experience at this center, Dhamma Vadana, um, with meditation, with extended meditation, ten days of silence. And so, what you might hear is something about, you know, some sort of noise or something going on in your head, and then music in the back of your mind. So that's just a little priming of what you might feel. So when this was installed in 30 channels. Um, it required people to move through the space. So have you all been to like that field in the Pritzker Pavilion space under the trellis? I think many people have. If you haven't, it's really worth checking out. It's a big, wide open space um, with at least 30 channel sound. I think could even be potentially more. And so I designed it with the idea that there would be a ring around the outside of binaural beats that are all kind of paired with one frequency that's kind of close to another going around the circle one ring in was that plus a little bit more sonic information, some kind of other instruments and stuff, not just pure sine waves. And then the inside would be more musical. There's more stuff happening. So as you came into the space, you would kind of be able to walk in and hear more. But I designed it with the idea that you would experience binaural beats around the periphery. What I found was that it didn't quite work as I had hoped or as I had intended. Um, it requires a lot of bodily motion through the field to experience those differences because it's, as you can imagine, and we'll see in a second, when you move from one sine wave to another around the periphery of a space, or in this, it'll be the periphery, but between any two speakers, that speed of that beating pattern should change, right? Because you're hearing it's a combination of volume and, and the frequencies that you're um, hearing. And so during the installation time, I was actually just running from one end to the next and was like out of breath. And I'm like a runner. So I was like, this is cool. And at the same time, I kind of freaked out because I was like, this is really not an accessible piece. Um, first of all, it's on a grassy field. And so anyone who has mobility challenges, that's kind of the worst case for moving through a space. Um, and then also, obviously, you won't be able to like run. A lot of people can't run from one spot to the next to experience all these differences. The way that the directionality of the speakers also made a big difference in the way that the binaural beats could have been perceived. They were very, um, they were like kind of top down directional. There wasn't a lot of uh, crossover in the space. And so that made me think about this idea of kind of accessibility, the way that different bodies move through spaces and making work that requires motion. So I think a lot of people who have worked with cleats and who have been in this space before and then also um, these prior um, workshops as well have probably seen that a lot of work for multi-channel space is where there's an event in the, the, in the field and then it moves through the speaker space and someone can sit in one stationary location and perceive that. The work that I've done so far has required motion and I want to talk about a piece that's coming up um, in March of next year that's, as it's designed, will require motion through the space and I just want to think through and hear feedback from you also about, um, yeah, the accessibility dynamics that that might bring about. Okay, I think that's probably good here. Yeah, so the way that this is designed for tonight, for right now, um, around the perimeter of the space we're in right now, you can see the numbers of the speakers, um, are binaural beats and some other sine waves that move. So there should be you know, some beating patterns that are kind of steady and then other ones that are moving through time. In the center ring, just those middle four speakers, um, there's other stuff. So there's like instruments and some sort of like what might feel like songs in the back of your head. And I know some of you have already experienced this, so I'm just gonna play a section. I'm not gonna play the whole thing. Um, yeah, but I encourage you to get up and walk around and see if you can feel any of these changes in the beating patterns that are happening around the edge. And for any of you who also know um, like where I'm going with this, this is not brainwave entrainment. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. This is just binaural beats that are creating beating patterns that are additional to the, the sine waves on their own. Okay, I'm checking the time. Oh, time's going so fast. Okay, so yeah, I'm just gonna play the project now. One moment. You can get up and you know move around the space as you like.
you all so much for moving around. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for getting up and moving. So does anyone have like a response or a thought on the, the relationship between your body and the sine waves that are happening? You can grab the mic if you have any thoughts or questions. And also, if not, I can just keep going. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Some people do and don't perceive the binaural beating also. Hello. Um, I like to share that I perceived um, different like harmonics, playing with different harmonics sounding in one side of the room versus what, like a different one. Um, and I guess just like different octaves of those harmonic frequencies. Uh, and then what was the other thing? Oh, I also liked um, hearing kind of like the clashing waves when two or more frequencies were like very close in pitch and like kind of dissonant, like, I don't know, I like that dissonance and stuff. Yeah. So you can like hear that and feel that. Cool, yeah, thank you for sharing that. There's some moments where it actually moves from like further apart and then, so you get that fast pattern, buh, 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 and then they move closer and that feels um, maybe like part of what you're talking about. Also, there's like the bodily feeling of some of those, especially the subs that feel like you can actually feel the pressure. At least I can. What was your um, target range for the beats and why are there beats? Huh, that's an interesting question. So I don't think there was a target range. You know, the beats, I just kind of, I like the effect. I like that combinatory like third sound, maybe fourth sound. Um, but for this one, I wasn't trying to do this process of brainwave entrainment. Or I wasn't engaging with that process. But for this project I have coming up, I will be. So that one, I do have target ranges, and I do have, you know, like an intended effect in mind that I'm curious about. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Oh yeah. Thanks for using the mic. I wonder if you could say a little bit about. Um, I couldn't always tell if I was uh, achieving a certain difference of perspective experience by moving my head, my body, like you were describing in dream in the dream house, versus things just changing. Right. Exactly. And you, you you would be more familiar with <laughs> which one of those that was. Yeah. I was curious if you could comment. Thank you. Yeah, it's a little because it is. Um, yeah, there are some that are moving, and it's a little more dense. It's kind of confusing to tell what's what. There are a few binaural beats that continue for minutes at a time, like through I forget which at this point which frequency ranges that are more steady. For this system, I noticed earlier today, if I was like almost under one of the speakers, that's where I felt that motion of like slowing down and speeding up. But if I tried to just split the difference between two, it didn't. I didn't notice that motion. You know, I had to get pretty close to one of them to feel the speed changing. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure I'm, yeah, not an acoustic physicist, but I think there's a connection between amplitude and frequency that's happening right there. Yeah. So I'm wondering where the, uh, the binaural beats are located in terms of speaker position. So you, you talked about spreading them around the periphery, right? Yes, uh, yeah. But sometimes in between two speakers or directly below one is where I would hear the most beats, so evidently it's mm -hmm. not one speaker on the periphery with another on the periphery, but two that are closer together. Right, so. In the corners. Well, right. Well, and, and the subwoofers also were kind of permeating right. the whole space. So the sub kind of complicates things a bit. So I should have actually like documented this more. So like one and two would be two different sine waves that are maybe, you know, five to 10 hertz apart. Okay. Two and three would also be the same, but then one and three would be the same frequency for the ones that are creating binaural beats. So as you move from one to two, you would experience it. And then the same thing in the opposite direction from two to three, et cetera, around the perimeter, per, the, like, the perimeter. Yeah. Are there also standing waves within this space? Yes, you know, absolutely. That's a sensation that I have. Yeah, so that we'll see. Hopefully I'll have time, but there's a third piece I want to play that's like a demo kind of of something I have coming up, and there's definitely a standing wave. And if you're um, almost anywhere in the space, you can feel it, but in the middle, you definitely feel it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so with <clears throat> acoustic um, instruments like a piano, 
um, if you play whatever note, um, the natural envelope of that note will, like you can hear the overtones, so it'll resolve to another note. I forget exactly what the notes are, but like I was, I was watching something on that um, several years ago. Like the, um, the note your ear, like when they talk about pieces resolving, Mm -hmm. um, it's because of the the overtones created by acoustic instruments. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering with sine waves, which are obviously not they're not acoustic; they're generated. Um, if you were to let those play out, they'll just stay at the same frequency indefinitely. There won't be any resolution. Yeah. So, yeah. so the beating that's happening is just it's just math. It's not from any yeah, as far as I understand it, yeah. It's just that combinatory effect of the difference between the frequencies that creates that, that third or fourth thing that is like in your brainstem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but no harmonic, there shouldn't be any harmonic series just naturally above them. But I mean, yeah, the space like reverb and like resonance in the space that could happen too, I think. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay, cool. I want to play and talk about a little bit about a piece that doesn't require movement. So I'm just going to play a little chunk of this um, to give a sense of kind of the difference. And I really want to continue to think about the way that maybe bodies move in space, what you experience, the benefits that could bring, but then also the challenges when it comes to mobility. And the bigger picture that I have in the back of my mind for all of this is like the broader sociological accessibility of like art space. That was something that I thought was so appealing and exciting about the pavilion project is that it's public space, it's in a park. There were all kinds of people coming in and just like, uh, yeah, they were surprised to find it. Some people came intentionally, some didn't. Um, there was like a mom who came in with her kid and didn't like it and she was like, this is what we used to call in my day, hippy dippy trippy music. And then they took off, you know? And I like that, you know, I like that um, conversation happening. I mean, it wasn't, that was kind of one-sided conversation. But I think art spaces, and then we'll also be talking in a minute about like a church or a sacred space, um, have different challenges for accessibility. Anyway, okay, I'm talking too much. This is a piece that I did that Stefan Moore actually invited me to take part in a couple of different installations, one called Unpop at Burning Man, and one called Hearing that was in a few Chicago parks. And this is an eight channel uh, piece that the idea is that you're sitting in the middle. So you can see this diagram where there's like comfy stuff where you can be in the middle of the eight channel system and be stationary. And so I think there's a lot that that um, offers for a variety and diversity of bodies. Um, and so the piece moves around you from that position and hopefully you can hear some of that motion right now too. Um, let's see. I'm gonna open up this new project. Okay. And this is mostly recorded, I think this is all recorded on an ace tone combo organ that I love. Okay, so I'll just play a bit of this to give you a sense.
sorry to cut it off. Um, so, thank you. Um, so, as you can see on this diagram, there are basically four stereo pairs that are just different rhythmic parts. And those are on one, two, and then paired on four and eight, paired on 15 and 16, or 16 and 15. Um, and if you're sitting in the middle of the space, probably you had the best uh, vantage point. I don't know if it should be vantage or like audition point. Um, you can hear the parts changing through the progression of the piece, but they're all in the space. So they're moving in, I think, a clockwise path around the perimeter. Again, it's about that perimeter. So yeah, that doesn't require any motion. You can hear change. Um, and this was just ongoing. I think this was up for, I forget how long it was playing, but it was more than that cycle. Um, and so you could hear parts that are coming back again later on. Um, yeah, so that's how that one works. It doesn't require you to walk around, but still has like a feeling of motion without it being like a programmed event, if that makes sense. Okay, any like thoughts on that one? Experiences, responses? I haven't had a chance to tell you yet, but um, we played it again this summer at Burning Man. Cool, okay. <laughs> And I was out there once at like three o'clock in the morning uh, and uh, it started playing and I got totally transfixed. And at some point in the middle, I looked up and there were about 40 people in the piece, all oh, just completely yeah. like. Cool. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, it's a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah completely, <laughs> there, was, there was nothing going on <laughs> with any of those people. Hippy dippy trippy music. <laughs> cool, anyone else, any like questions or thoughts? I, I feel like there's a better sense of entrainment here than in the previous piece. Ah, uh -huh, cool. And I think a lot of it has to do with the, the rhythms of the individual parts played on the organ. Right, right. Yeah, because there's like a steady kind of tempo, but then different rhythms within that, maybe. Okay, so that brings me, oh yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I love this piece, it's fantastic. Thanks. thank you. Yeah. Um, one thing I liked about it is I kept trying to uh, uh, discern the different period, the different cycles. Yeah. And um, so it was a matter of attention, and that varies by individual, I know. But in my case, uh, maybe the experience I had was um, it kept uh, it kept taking my attention away from what I was trying to do in terms of mm -hmm. identify the different cycles, yeah. and I, at at some point it was like as if it it and my whole experience had just entered my mind because I couldn't tell what was my mind and what was the piece. Yeah. And that was fantastic. That's cool. Yeah. So I don't if you uh, if you felt like you wanted to talk about any of the the different cycles and so on. To the extent yeah. that there are cycles even, I don't know. Um, that would be really interesting. Yeah, so I think we made it through like four or five of the sections. You could sort of see in the project behind. And they're basically in like three, four, five, and six, or two, three, four, and five. It's been a while since I did it. Um, so yeah, you get like that kind of like tumbling over effect. I think it's two, three, four, and five um, are the like rhythmic sections. And especially five is, or three and five are like the ones that take a cycle or take a while to to fall over and like line up again in the same spot, you know? Yeah. Cool, anyone else have anything? I have a completely um, unserious thought that just popped into my head while I was listening to that. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> uh, since like human beings don't have um, the ability to like move our ears, like a lot of animals in the animal kingdom, and like move their ears around. Yeah. And so I was thinking about that, and then that made me think about how spiders obviously have eight eyes, and I wondered if there are any animal with more than two ears. Whoa, that's a cool um, question. Okay, for anyone who didn't hear it, the question is, you know, some animals have more eyes than others. Do any have more ears than others? Um, Does anyone Google know? Is not telling me much right now. Okay. <laughs> Google doesn't have many answers. So yeah, that that piece made me think of what the experience of hearing something like that would be to a creature that had more than uh, two ears. Yeah. Or one that could move its ears uh, at will. The only thing I can offer is that I just spent a long time this summer talking to a friend of mine who's studying oysters, and how oysters determine where to settle on the ocean bed is entirely to do with listening. 
because they're basically they have no eyes and so their entire body acts as an ear uh, so it's like full body ear I don't know that's that's what I got <laughs> I knew I loved oysters uh, fish can uh, sense electrical fields they have a organ the, the line that stretches along the sides of fish an organ for sensing electrical fields. Right, which kind of bypasses the ear, direct to electricity. Monosphinx have that as well. I thought it, I thought of a, an equally equally fanciful notion to your comments, or, is that we probably have to look to hyperdimensional beings yes. <laughs> to find those with more than two ears. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> hyperdimensional beings. This is where I wanted to go today. <laughs> okay. Okay. Jellyfish have between four and eight ears. So, yeah, not binaural beats, but quadraphonic beats happening in their bodies. That sounds amazing. Anyone else? Animals? Cherubim are described as a cloud of eyes. So I suppose there's also a cloud of ears somewhere in hyperdimensions. Ah. Is that seraphim, cherubim? Cherubim. Cherubim. Yeah. My question is much less interesting, yeah. Yeah. but um, how uh, carefully do you set volume for each one of these performances uh, before you play them? Yeah, so that's something that I do have to kind of like install on the day, depending on the system. And I came in today and just like, yeah, had to like do that. Um, if we have time, I want to play a little bit of this um, other piece that I had to like change some of the volumes disproportionately because they were, you know, the like, different frequencies required different volumes. Most of this stuff I just was able to like set the math, the, the volume for each track. Yeah. <laughs> and then the sub was kind of a wild card. I just like felt it out. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. I've been talking around the idea of binaural beats, or I'm sorry, of um, brainwave entrainment for a minute. And I want to just like introduce this a little bit as a possibility. So two different worlds combine in the, um, the possibility of brainwave entrainment. One is vibrational healing. And you can see lots of the different um, forms that, that vibrational healing has taken over time, classically and in modern times or contemporarily. Um, also, these banned TED Talks, I think, are fascinating because they're you know, shown to be pseudoscientific by some standard. I don't know what that standard is. And so they're like off the TED website or whatever, but they still exist if you look them up. So take note of these names. And that is the John Grisham that you're thinking of, who has one of these. And these have to do with vibrational healing, et cetera. OK, I see people taking photos. <laughs> And I'm like, yes, please watch these because they're really, really wild. I love wild stuff like this, right? Like, you know, going beyond, uh, beyond scientific knowledge and exploring just weird shit. I don't know. OK. So sound healing also takes lots of different forms. These are a few of the different ones. And these are, have different le levels of documentation in scientific literature. Um, yeah, many of these are documented in peer-reviewed journals, and many of them aren't. So these are just a few of the examples that I know of. Rife machines we could talk about in a minute um, are, I think, the most quackery of all of them, the least, um, the least real. So brainwave entrainment is somewhere in this space, right? It's vibrational healing, but it's also um, sound healing. The idea is that brainwaves, your brain frequencies will, brainwave frequencies will synchronize with the rhythm of periodic external stimuli, including sound, light, and other vibrations. This is part of complex systems theory, which extends into sociology and social theory and philosophy as well, um, and kind of like, I think, physics. Um, there were early, very early experiments with pendulum clocks and metronomes that had an effect on brain speed. And then this has now become an alternative healing practice using primarily sound and primarily using binaural beats. So if anyone like looks up binaural beats on YouTube or whatever, there are a lot of these things that have like a pretty ethereal, maybe you could say new age background, like synth, soft synth palette, and then a binaural beat happening with it. And there are tons of them, different uh, length and styles, some that go like all night long, you know, you can play it while you sleep for however many hours. So you can see on the left that uh, different states of consciousness are said to be connected to different uh, periodicity of these beats. So a delta wave is like the, the deepest or like kind of slowest consciousness or slowest uh, 
speed of brain waves. And then gamma would be like the highest. I don't actually work with that one, but like beta waves are supposed to be like a really alert, awake state of mind is um, functioning at that speed. So this is, like I said, something that hasn't been like documented well. We don't really know. Um, yeah, we don't really know. So the piece that I'm trying to work on, um, that's actually too much text, is called The Tuning of the Elements. And this is uh, gonna, it was supposed to happen on March 21st, 2020, if you recall what was going on in the world at that time. Um, it didn't happen. That was like exactly a week after everything locked down in Chicago. And so it's rescheduled for three years later. And this is gonna be a four hour dur durational performance slash installation um, with four 49 minute sets of music and sound. So the installation will be going through the whole four hours, but there's a string quartet in the middle. I think that actually might be violin, two violas, and cello now, and maybe not double bass because um, just the interference between bass frequencies and the sub when I started like working with this. It's a seven channel installation around the edge and then the sub in the middle, kind of like the strings are like water buffalo looking out. And then there's a, what I think of as a moat. So I have a floor plan I can show um, right here. So this is the floor plan of the piece. Starting to the left is like the quote unquote beta frequency that would interact with the fundamental at maybe like 15 hertz difference, I think. And then next to that is the alpha, which is a little bit slower. And then going around clockwise would go all the way to the delta wave on the far right, which is the slowest one. The idea of brainwave entrainment is that there's a certain pace of this beating pattern that's happening. And if you want to change your brain speed, basically the, the speed of your brain frequencies, you can change them by adjusting to something that's faster or slower than where you already are when you enter the space. And so what I'm saying is if you wanted to relax yourself, you could move in a clockwise manner from those two arrows at the bottom. We would be going from hearing something that's really fast and stimulating and then moving to something that's really slow. The other direction would be moving from a slow pace and then going around counterclockwise to something that's faster and that would speed it up. Now, I'm totally agnostic about the effectiveness of this practice. Um, I have no idea. I like haven't really experienced it in a way individually that I can, you know, that I can like talk about. <laughs> um, a lot of people have. A lot of people say that this is a powerful relaxation or energizing um, effect. And so the whole point of the project, I think, is just to kind of like help people explore their bodily sensations in the space and see what they experience and see, you know, if they're skeptical or believing in these kind of effects of sound on the body. Because sound has all kinds of effects on the body. And I'm curious if this is one of them or not. So I kind of want to like talk to people afterward also. Um, yeah. Anyone have any thoughts on this? Or like, does anyone want to weigh in? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Um, so, just thinking about the uh, the reflectiveness of the space at the Renaissance Society, mm -hmm. um, how did you use that to approach how you created this piece? Slash, how do you use like reflectiveness or like the the reflections of the room that you were in to compose music? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So this one's going to be challenging also because of the string players. You can see that they're in the middle facing toward that moat that goes between the two. And I think that's going to be, that's just going to take that installation day to figure out because the space is reverberant and reflective, um, really high ceilings. This is going to be in the small chapel. I believe it's still happening there. The Bond Chapel on University of Chicago campus, which is like the small one. Um, and so we'll get all kinds of like inter frequency interactions between everything. The most powerful binaural beats will be if you're like standing between, should be, but if you're standing between the fundamental and any of those um, around the periphery. But I think, yeah, I think reflection is going to be a real issue. I think there should be, so if the fundamental, um, if all of the three fundamental speakers are kind of like pointed in that direction, there should be some kind of like a standing fundamental in the, the middle around the sub, I think. Yeah. Yes. Okay, secondary question to that. So if this is happening in Bond Chapel, um, how would you say, like, how, how do you imagine the difference for this piece would be between Bond Chapel and um, the actual room of the Renaissance Society? Oh, fascinating. Like their actual gallery room, you know? Yeah, because that's like, has all kinds, I mean, architecturally yeah. might even be better. That's I what think. I thought you were talking about at first. <laughs> right, they're just like hosting it or sponsoring it because mm -hmm. that space is really cool. It's really reflective. Mm -hmm. Like you said, that's like, I don't know, probably more reflective, um, mm -hmm. but has lots of like better angles for sound. You know, yeah. it's like, because well, I think it's a little too symmetrical maybe in Bond Chapel. 
but it's bigger, so it fits mm -hmm. more people. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I guess that's still an option, because that's kind of like a concrete box in a way that seems scary to me. <laughs> yeah. Wow, okay, yeah. Yeah, I think that seems like prohibitive, probably yeah. for this project. Yeah. I like the wood in the chapel, because it's like wood paneling. Um, yeah. This one is meant for, so over the course of four hours, if people wanted to have this effect, they could slowly move, and even move from station to station to slowly sit in a zone. Hopefully there's gonna be like pillows or something, I'm trying to work on that, to have like, if you're starting at the beta phase, you could stay for 15 minutes, you could stay for an hour if you want, because there are four different kind of stations. So you could stay there and then hopefully feel relaxed at the end of your time. Or you can walk through. I think most people will probably walk through and just kind of like, pick their path around the moat and then make their way to the other end and leave. It's um, chairs that you can take out, so it's cool, yeah. And so we have to find the right spot to get them out of there, but yeah, as like modular seating. So are all the, the individual speakers, are they just playing sign tones or what? Yes, so I think I'm probably gonna have like a frequency array to make it sound more sonically interesting, but I don't know how much to do that. So for today, I did a little demo that's just pure sign tones. So I wanna maybe play that now. This is, unless there's more questions. Yeah, there, well, what, what are the string players gonna be doing? So they're doing things, um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I have the like sort of composition over here that looks really weird. They're basically changing, they're gonna be playing two different notes that are tuned to the fundamental of the piece, which is all oriented around the Schumann resonance, which is supposed to be like the frequency of the planet, which is 7.83 hertz. So it's like, that's the fundamental frequency and it's built up from there to pick the tuning note for the strings. The strings are moving back and forth between two notes in this kind of like oscillating pattern and then each of the four movements will be a different oscillation, so different, basically, articulation. But they're working within a scale. There will be the harmonic series above that fundamental, which, frankly, is probably gonna be equal temperament. I wanted it to be just intonation, but it's really hard to do with strings. Um, it's hard to find those, those um, it's hard to, to tune all of those notes. <laughs> James Tenney did it. With players that rehearsed for a long time <laughs> for that piece. We'll probably have like one or two rehearsals. I saw a quartet uh, playing one of his pieces one time in Montreal, and they, every one of them was watching the clock and the tuner mm -hmm. to read out their frequency in real time. Yeah. So they could do the trajectories. Oh, that's interesting. If they were like, if they had a whatever, Dr. Graham. Yeah, okay. Any, any thoughts on this, questions? I think I'm like over my time. I'm way over my time. Okay, I'm just gonna play a little bit. Oh yeah, no, yeah. Thinking of how long has passed since when you were supposed to present this piece, how much would you say you have changed the piece from uh, March 2020 versus now when you're going to present it in 2023? Yeah, so it's changed a lot. So I think probably the frequency, like just messing with it in here and at home, I have sort of like a quad setup. I think I might actually want to double some of the like fundamentals, but I also, like I said, want to have more of a spectrum for like audio interest because if it's just sine waves, it's like. Um, not as interesting. So it's probably gonna be like some kind of series above. Um, this, so the, the tuning notes changed a lot for the strings, because I tried a tuning, like yeah, yeah, with four strings that didn't really work. It was too much tension for some instruments and too floppy for others. Because I don't wanna tune to 440, but I have to figure out like what's the sweet spot for that too. Yeah, those are a couple changes so far. Yeah. Okay, I wanna play a little bit. Um, and this is a little quieter, but again, this is something that you could, so let me actually show the diagram quickly. Um, so the fundamentals are 13, 5, 2, 2 and 3, 8 and 16. And then beta starts over here by the, the um, what is that, the bar? And then delta is over here by the office. So if you want to do the thing, there is kind of a moat right here. You know, you can go like around the edge would be like fastest pace to slowest pace over here. Does that make sense? So that would be to relax yourself is the idea. And if you wanna energize yourself, if you're feeling depressed perhaps, you could start over here, move around to that side. 
But I, yeah, we don't have much time, so we can just like maybe walk around a little, check it out. Yeah, is that cool? Okay, cool. We've got nothing but time. Okay, so here we go. Um, let me play a piece of this. And I don't think it's that long anyway. So here we go. Where is it? There it is.
Okay, how are we doing? Does anyone need more time? I think that's probably good, right? Okay, cool. So I think we are reaching the end of this part. So I'm going to stop this. <laughs> um, yeah, so if anyone wants to like talk about their experience, I'm so curious. There are lots of like weird things that I noticed just today. I was like in here for not long setting it up. Um, yeah, weird like sonic phenomena, but then also like, you know, pointers for when I actually do this for real. So this is good practice. Um, yeah, so come talk to me after this about what happened for you. Awesome. Whitney, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me, everyone. Yeah. I'll just insert a couple of words here at the end. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we're excited about uh, having uh, 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 folks who are interested in working in multi-channel audio come in and use this space. It's great to see a number of artists here uh, who are either working on uh, uh, pieces already uh, to be presented here, and also a number of folks, uh, 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 Scott and Paige and Victoria and Ben and Bill, and probably a couple of other people I'm also forgetting to mention who have all uh, done performances already on the system over the last year. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the speaker system and about being on the series, come and talk to uh, uh, me. If you want to uh, engage with Whitney about uh, uh, all of the music that she's presented and her ideas with multi-channel, please come talk to her. If you are interested in hooking up your computer to the system, even tonight, and uh, trying out uh, uh, working with it, please uh, check out our website if you haven't, cleat.info. There's links to the drivers you need to install. There's a little uh, user's manual on that page. Uh, uh, and uh, the things you need to get, you, get yourself going with uh, actually connecting with the system. We're serious. We'd like any of you who are here to throw ideas at us and, and get involved and come be part of the shows. Um, we have a, a, a typically one show uh, a month on the second Friday of the month that is dedicated to Cleat artists. So the next one uh, is going to be not this coming Friday, but the Friday after for November, and another one happening in December, another one happening in January, and so on and so forth. So uh, please come out and join us for those uh, shows. We have one more uh, uh, talk in this series of talks happening a week from tonight. Uh, there's this guy named Stefan Moore who's going to give a talk about his approach to using the system. You could come and hear what he has to say. Uh, it's probably not going to be nearly as interesting as this one. Uh, so uh, I think at this point we'll transition in the evening and I uh, uh, just want to say one more time thank you to Whitney Johnson for this great presentation and being so generous with your process and everything. Thank it's you so all great for to coming. Have you here. Thank you, Stefan, for asking me. Thanks, Ben, for coming early and helping me out too. <laughs>